We'll take our Bibles and let's turn to Proverbs chapter 2. Let's read the first five verses, six verses. Amen. Proverbs chapter 2, the first six verses. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so shalt thou incline thy ear unto wisdom and apply thy heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as hidden treasures, then shalt thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. If for the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding he layeth up sound wisdom for righteous for the righteous he is a buckler to them that walk uprightly lord jesus we thank you lord for being able to be here tonight god we pray for your touch upon our minds upon our spirits tonight we glorify you and magnify you in jesus name amen sister dazel why don't you come Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God is great. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is great and greatly to be praised. God is great in my soul. God is great and greatly to be praised. God is great. God is great and greatly to be praised. God is great in my soul. God is great and greatly to be praised. God is great in my soul. For from sin and he gave me peace and joy within I've been buried in his name and of him I'm not ashamed I love Jesus best of all God is great God is great and greatly to be praised God is great in my soul. God is great and greatly to be praised. God is great in my soul. For he saved my soul from sin. And he gave me peace and joy
Jesus. Hallelujah for saving my soul. Thank you, Jesus. You're great. You're worthy to be praised, to be magnified and glorified, Jesus. Hallelujah. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great. How great is our God, oh, how great is our God, how great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great. How great is our God, the splendor of the King, cloth in majesty, let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. And darkness tries to hide. And trembles at his voice. And trembles at his voice. Thank you, 
Jesus. You are great, oh God, and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. Amen. You can be seated. I'm going to sit down tonight. My blood pressure was acting up a little bit for me today. So, yes, when I came back and checked it, Omar, it was very low. So I'm still in recovery mode from that. So, um, Brother Mike, why don't you come and hand out some handouts? They're all cross-threaded here. Amen. Where's Mama Donna tonight? She's under the weather. Yeah, there's a little bit of that going around again. So, let's pray for Mama Donna then. Lord Jesus, we pray, God, your touch, God, upon Sister Donna's body, God. Lord, we pray your hand upon her, God, upon the others that are not feeling well tonight, Lord. We pray your touch in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. So, we're going to talk about... Modeling Jesus, modeling Jesus, amen. Uh, real Christianity is about life change, is it not? It's, is uh, Georgie's here? We'll wait a second. Amen. God bless you, Brother McNabb. So real Christianity is about life change. It is not just about religion. Just set those there. And if some more folks come in, we can hand those out. Uh, the central part, of we have on the right, we have the disciples' cross. This is the cross that we bear. Prayer, holiness, tithing, fellowship, Bible study. Amen. The Bible says to take up your cross daily. Amen. These are some of the things that we should take up daily. Amen. And when holiness is present in a believer's life, it indicates that a real change has indeed taken place. In addition to glorifying God, holiness has the effect of testifying to others around us what God has done in our life. Amen. It is possible to keep the rules on habits and practices of Bible study, prayer, tithing, fellowship through sheer human effort. However, the habit of holiness, especially its inner aspects, can only be manifested through the enabling of God's Spirit. Amen. Holiness on the outside should be a reflection of what is on the inside of us. Amen. It is showing the world that we are saved and we are redeemed. Now, in, uh, let's talk about a little, little story here. In college, a friend wanted to learn to play the piano in the first and only setting he was not interested in the scales that were being taught. He just wanted to start playing a song. Amen. Now, my wife can come and play beautifully, but she's had a little practice. Amen. And we have to, uh, we have to stay in practice with the things. We have to have the, the foundation of principles before applications are discussed. There's a lot of people in a Christian walk that have no foundation. They don't understand why they do the things that they do. And as you can see, the Christian life 
is just, it, it's, it's a learning upon learning upon learning. It's step by step by step, building block upon building block upon building block. So, number one, what do you think this is? God, the Bible teaches that holiness is one of the basic, what, of God nature. Look at, look at the scripture. Exalt the Lord, Psalms 99 and 9, and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. So, God does not have holiness. God is holy. So what, what would be? It would be one of the basic characteristics of God's nature. Amen. What are, what are some of the other characteristics of God's nature? Holiness is one of them. How about steadfastness would be another part of God's nature. Doesn't the Bible say, I'm God and I change not? Can anybody think of any other of the characteristics of God? Faithful. God is faithful to us. Even sometimes if we're not faithful to him, the Lord is faithful to us. Amen. So number two, personal holiness is absolutely essential in maintaining what? Hebrews 12, 14. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16 from the New Living Translation. But now you must be holy in everything that you do, just as God who chose you to be his children is holy. For he himself has said, you must be holy because I am holy. So... Personal holiness is absolutely essential in maintaining what? Our salvation. Okay, it's not salvation in and of itself, but the response that we have to God's nature inside of us does bring us to the place where we will either walk away from the Lord or walk closer to God. Holiness involves, let's read, let's read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 17 to 7 and 1. Uh, Mike, why don't, you, why don't you help me? Come get this thing and, and read for me. 1, 2, there we go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Hallelujah. You can pull up a chair too if you want. Yeah, we can be cozy. You can come sit next to me. You can sit over there, whatever you want to do. Second Corinthians six seventeen to seven and one. Are you? Uh, do you have that scripture on your page? Yep. 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 The Lord also says, "Leave them and stay away. Don't touch anything that isn't clean. Then I will welcome you and be your father." You will be my sons and my daughters, as surely as I am God, the all-powerful. My friends, God has made us these promises. So we should stay away from everything that keeps our bodies and spirits from being clean. We should honor God and try to be completely like him. All right, so holiness involves both the negative concept of separation and the positive concept of dedication. Okay, what would be some of the things that we should stay away from that, that uh, keeps our spirit from being clean? What makes your spirit dirty? Sin? Okay. What kind of sin? What is, what, name, name some sins. How about lying, cheating, stealing, causing disunity? You know, the Bible says there, there are six things that God hates, and the seventh one God really hates. 
which is he that sows discord among the brethren. So sowing disunity is another thing. Pornography, uh, drunkenness, partying, these are all things that will cause our spirits to be unclean. Okay, let's look at Romans 12 and 1 for dedication. That, that 2 Corinthians 6 was about separation. Let's look at dedication, Romans 12 and 1 from the New Living Translation. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will accept. When you think of what he has done for you, is this too much to ask? Sometimes some of the other versions put out some nice thoughts. This is a nice thought here. Put your body out for the Lord and don't drop the microphones. That was your phone. I was wondering why I didn't hear a thump. And uh, when you think of what he has done for you, is this too much to ask? Um, in the King James Version, it says... This is just your reasonable service. In other words, it's no big deal. Now, the power to live holy, 2 Timothy 1, 13 to 14 from the NLT. Brother Mike, you want to read that? Hold on to the pattern of right, right teaching you learned from me. And remember to live in the faith and love that you have in Jesus Christ. With the help of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully guard what has been entrusted to you. Okay, so the power to live holy lives does not come from our flesh, but where does it come from? The help of the Holy Ghost, the, the Spiritu Santo. Uh, let's see, how do we say that in Spanish? Holy, holy Ghost, oh, Santo Fantasma, yeah, Holy Ghost. Santo Fantasma. See, we say Holy Ghost with the King James, Holy Spirit in the new, new versions and Holy Ghost in Spanish is Santo Fantasma. Or is it Ghost of Holy? I don't know. Fantasma Santo. <laughs> Praise God. So we are motivated. Okay, let's read these next three scriptures. 1 John 5 and 3, Psalms 25 and 10, and 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. This is love for God to obey commands, and his commands are not burdensome. All the ways of the Lord are loving for those who keep the demands of the covenant. And how can we be sure that we belong to him by obeying his commandments? If someone says, I belong to God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and does not live in the truth. But those who obey God's word really do love him. This is the way to know whether or not we live in him. That's an interesting way to put it, okay? He who doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar, and, and um, the truth does not live in him. Amen. So um, we are motivated to live holy lives, not merely by enforced rules, but by what? Our love for God. In the marriage relationship, there are rules to the relationship. Amen. Just try go, going out and cheating on your wife. And when she hands your head to you, amen, the foundation of marriage is what? Love. Amen. JJ, don't you love Dazel? Come on, get all mushy now. Amen. That foundation is love, yet within a marriage there are rules to the relationship. Now, God gives us three holiness teachers that show us how to live a life that pleases him. Number one, Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. He made the church holy by the power of his word so that he would have a glorious and holy church without faults or spots or wrinkles or any other flaws. Okay, so what would the first one be? The Word, the Bible. Amen. The Bible does teach separation and holiness. 
Number two, uh, Ephesians 4, 11 through 15. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, but by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. There's so much that's interesting in this scripture. Okay, look at verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Okay. The pastor is not the only one that has a ministry. Now, obviously, ministry is not just preaching. Okay, there are other areas of ministry. And, of course, some of the ones we think about are, are children's ministry, youth ministry, prayer ministry, uh, hospitality, you know, all kinds, all kinds of stuff. That's their teaching home Bible studies, winning people to God. Those are all ministries. And we're supposed to help by equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. And what is the work of the ministry? For the building up of the body of Christ. Edification means building up. So it's not only the pastor's job to build up the church. It is what we're supposed to be able to do is impart some things to you to equip you to help to build the church of the living God. Amen? Amen. Now, notice he also says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness and deceitfulness of plotting. Unfortunately, not everybody that says, I'm a man of God is leading you in the right paths. That's, it's an unfortunate thing. Okay, and we cannot afford to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine that comes along. There's, there's winds of doctrine that are blowing today. And we need to be firmly established upon our foundation. Now, one of the winds of doctrine that's blowing today is when he talks about, in verse 11, he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Okay, what we are trying to be told is there is an office of an apostle and there is an office of a prophet. Well, if you look at the Amplified, it talks about prophet as an inspired speaker. And when a pastor is preaching, a lot of times these things really cross up okay if you look up the word apostle the word apostle means someone that is sent someone that goes okay in the modern terminology we may think of that as a missionary not as somebody holding um, sway over a church I, had, I told this story before I had a guy come in to church a few years ago. It's, I don't remember how long it is now, maybe 10 years ago. He comes up to me and says, um, I got a secret to tell you. I said, what's that? He said, I'm an apostle. And at that, mo at that moment, I wanted to tell him, and I'm Mickey Mouse, but I was trying to be nice. And the next week, he came back to second service and told me us apostles were sent to rule the church. So what he was telling me is God sent him to take over this church. Okay, he didn't like what I had to say and he never came back. Because that's part of my duty is to guard against false doctrine. Now, I have said before that if anybody ever comes to me and tells me that again, that I will tell them, make like an apostle and go. So, I was also told by somebody that we couldn't hope to have revival because we didn't have an apostle and prophet in our church. I laughed at him. Well-known preacher, too. Well-known preacher. I laughed at him. He told me I was a dangerous man. Well, guess what has happened? 
Are you telling me God is not moving in this church? So there's absurdity to what some of these things that are being, being taught today. But if you think about it, um, it talks about evangelists. What did Paul tell Timothy? He said, do the work of an evangelist. You're a pastor, but do a work of an evangelist. And as a pastor, sometimes I have to teach. What am I doing now? Teaching the Word of God. Okay? I've preached, I've preached things that have come to pass. I've, I've had people tell me in the past, how did I know? How did I know what? You don't know? No, I don't know. You want to tell me? No, I don't want to tell you. Okay, so God revealed something through the preaching, and that falls under that spirit of prophecy. So when we try to say, well, you're, you're just a pastor, you can't, be, you can't go, you can't be an apostle, you can't be, have any spirit of prophecy, something wrong with that. So th this is something that's actually flowing around in some of our circles now, and I caution you to be very careful of that because it's, I don't believe it's of God. All right, number three, the third holiness teacher. Look at the next scripture, Brother Mike. This is the new covenant. This is the new covenant I will make with my people on, the, on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts so they will understand them, and I will write them on their minds so they will obey them. All right, so what would that third holiness teacher be? The Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God will move upon you and put conviction upon you. And you have to listen to the Spirit of the Lord. Okay? Now, let's read the next two scriptures, Ephesians 2, 8 and 10, and Titus 3, 5 and 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus into good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God, might be careful to maintain good works. Okay, so here we apparently have, or by some people's thinking, we have two conflicting scriptures. By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. I Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, I've had many people tell me over the years that, see, it's totally unnecessary to have any measure of holiness because we're saved by faith, not by works. Yet, the Word of God tells us that we might be careful to maintain those good works. We are called to good works. And holiness is nothing more than what's on the inside of the Spirit of God coming on the outside. Amen. Now, if you think about Adam and Eve, let's go way back to the garden and... Adam and Eve figured out that they were naked. So what did they do? They did what they thought was good. They put on fig leaves, right? But what did God do? He said, no, I'm going to make you a tunic. And if you look at uh, the, the definition of a tunic in the Hebrew, it talks about garments that come down to the, the knees and the elbows. So um, the Lord wanted them covered in a little more than a tunic. All right, now, so our righteous works are not the means of us receiving the salvation, but they should be the result of us receiving salvation, okay? Now, relate it like this. Say that you get married and your spouse keeps living like she's single or he's single. Would you be very happy with that? No, there's a change that, that comes into the life. You start acting married. Well, when we get the Holy Ghost, we need to start acting like a child of God, inside and outside. Now, let's look at Matthew 5, 16 and James 24 and 2, 14 to 24. These, this is not the entire 10 verses, just part of it. 
Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Dear brothers and sisters, what's the use of saying you have faith if you don't prove it by your actions? That kind of faith can't save anyone. It isn't enough just to have faith. Faith that doesn't show itself by good deeds is no faith at all. It is dead and useless. I can't see your faith if you don't have good deeds, but I will show you my faith through my good deeds. So you see, we are made right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Well, that totally conflicts with what the, what the modern definition of Ephesians 2 and 8 is. By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest they may should boast. But if you think about what, the, what Paul was saying to the Ephesians, is your good works are not going to save you. You are saved by grace. But just because you are saved by grace, he later on, James later on tells us, it means that uh, we still have some, we, our, 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 the faith that we have has to be expressed in actions. Okay, let me say it that way. Okay, so there's, the Bible teaches that a genuine Christian will exhibit a noticeable witness when internal holiness is present in the heart. Again, what is inside of us should come to the outside of us. Right? Amen. amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Yeah. So there's three components of holiness. One is the Bible principle, which is eternal. That's unchangeable, objective truth that we must live by. You know, there are many people are teaching you today that you have your truth and I have my truth. You do realize that, right? Now there, there, there's a new uh, head of National Public Radio, and she's got this video out saying just that. You have your truth, I have my truth, and there is no truth. No, there is truth. There is Bible truth. Amen. Amen. Now, personal convictions, that's internal. That's a scriptural principle that you apply to your life. And many times in the past, I have used football for that. Some guys can watch a football game, doesn't do a thing for them. I mean, but other guys, they watch football, all of a sudden, they become animals. They want to gamble. They want to curse. They want to throw stuff at the TV and all kinds of crazy stuff. So for them, they need a conviction. They don't need to partake of that. Now, you could apply that to other situations. That's just one that I use for an example, but there are other situations that you could apply that to. Now, there's a standard for living. Those are external. That's your personal code of Christian ethics, with ult which ultimately controls your behavior. There are things that we believe that control how we act. Is that not correct? Amen. Are you going to get up and have a uh, half a bottle of whiskey before you go to work? No, because your ethics say that's not the right thing for us to do. There are people that do that. But your ethics say that's not. So there are some standards. Everybody has standards. Some are just higher than others. Amen? All right, let's go to page number four. Now, Three, three elements. Let's see. How, how are we doing for time? We've got plenty of time. I can, we, we started late, so I can go to 10 o'clock tonight, right? Yeah. <laughs> three elements, three components of holiness. Bible principles. The scriptural principles are the first level of consciousness that we need to understand. These come from the word of God. There are definite and explicit statements found in the word of God that gives us insight to holiness. One of them is Romans 12, 1 and 2. Can anybody quote Romans 12, 1 and 2 for me? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove whether it is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay? That's a pretty explicit statement. 
there are also implicit principles that we can apply to our modern situations of life. Amen. Let's face it, the apostles didn't have cell phones, they didn't have TV, they didn't have computer, so you're going to have to use principles out of the Word of God that you should use for the situation. What could be one principle? Can anybody tell me a, a, a principle from the Word of God that would apply to cell phones, computers, and television? How about in the book of Psalms? It says, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Now, obviously, the cell phone is not wicked, but there are things that you can find on the cell phone that are. So you have to apply that principle and control your eyes. Amen? Amen. So that would be a principle. The principles are eternal, unchanging, objective truths that we must live by. Now, number two, B, personal convictions. Where do convictions come from? Prayer. Our prayers can be subjective, and we can have difficulty knowing the difference between our spirit and the Holy Spirit. Now, there are people that do have personal convictions, and let's talk about one of them. The Bible talks about holidays and holy days, does it not? It says one esteems one above the other, and another one every day is alike. Let everybody conv be convinced in their own mind. There are people that look, for example, at Christmas, and they say, well, Christmas is too um, secular, so I don't want to celebrate it, and I don't want you to celebrate it, right? And they don't allow any Christian liberty there. So there can be a difference between our spirit and the Holy Spirit. Now, the Word of God mandates and principles are the standard by which we should live our lives. And often the term is used, I was convicted of that, and the connotation was a feeling or while in prayer. And the clarification is God definitely speaks to us and challenges us to grow and changes, change into his holiness. But the point is that these inner promptings must be rooted in the word. Not that, that they will not contradict the word of God. Nature of holiness is internal promptings in the time of need. It is the Holy Ghost in us and we need to understand what conviction is. What is conviction? Amen. Now, there's, I've talked about this before. There's a difference between conviction and condemnation. They both sound similar. And I've, I've used this example before. You're no good. You're low down. You could walk up right underneath the belly of a snake crawling in the sand. That's how low down you are. Now, condemnation is you can never change. Conviction says... You may be that, but with my help, you can overcome. You see the difference there? The devil will convict you. The devil will try to get you away from the house of the Lord. The devil will try to get you away from God by condemning you and saying you'll never change. You'll never be anything different. But the Holy Ghost will tell you that you can change. You can be different. That's the difference between conviction and condemnation. Condemnation is of the devil Conviction is of God. Does everybody understand the difference there? So, what is conviction? A basic command of Scripture, which I have purposed to follow in my life, whatever the cost, a scriptural principle, which I apply to my life personally. This conviction becomes an internal persuasion, is also unchanging. What are the qualifications of a conviction? Number one, A, it must be seen in your life. It must not change. Okay, we, we have got to be to the place where our word is our bond. Amen? I can't tell you how many people have promised me help on this. I'm not talking about our church, folks. I'm talking about outside the church from other churches. Um, we're going to help you do this. We're going to help you do that. If I waited on them, we still wouldn't even have this wall done and the carpet done. Okay, so if we tell somebody, if we say something that we're going to do, our word must be our bond. Amen. Amen. So uh, be very careful of that. And, and when you have a conviction and God puts a true Bible conviction in your life, don't let it change. It must be consistent through one's lifestyle and anything that does not meet the above 
qualifications is a preference and not a conviction. Okay? People have preferences. And uh, a preference is not a conviction. Amen. There's many arguments about beards in the Bible or beards in the church. And um, Jesus had a beard. Does my preference is I'm not going to grow a beard. So that's not really a conviction. It's just a preference. So a standard for living. What are standards? Ex standards are external things that govern our life. Okay. How many of you work? Okay. What time do you have to get up to be at work at, on time? Whatever. Daisel, you got to be at work in the city. What time you got to be at work? 8 o'clock? 8.30. So what time do you have to get up to make sure that you're to, off to work on time? Seven, hopefully. All right, so there's a standard that you put in your life that I'm going to get up at 7 o'clock. But see, she's got a little bit of an out because she sits next to her dispatcher. So she's got it easy sometimes. But the standard is, okay, your kids are off. Mike, what time do you got to get your kids up to make sure they're at school on time? That's Katie's job. That's Katie's job. Okay, so what time do you have to leave to make sure you're at school on time? Six. Six a.m.? Correct. Ooh. I thought it'd be like seven. Uh, hour and a half. Hour and a half? You got to be at school at 7.30? Uh, well, we'll be there at 8.20, but I get there early. You get there early. So he works up in the Bronx. You work in the section where they kill people? They don't kill people there. Amen. So God bless Brother Mike. He's out the door. At, he's up at 6 o'clock. Or out the door at 6. Out the door at 6. Or out. 5.30. So he's up at 5.30. So his standard is, I'm up at 5.30. So when you think you got it bad, just look at Mike. He's a trooper. Trooper, real trooper. So, and I have had times like that in my life. He's been doing it. How long have you been doing that now? 17, 18 years getting up that early and going. So God bless you, man. Five years of it drove me nuts. I used to have to drive 200, 250 miles a day doing my service routes. And that was really, really, actually I did it for more, more than five years. Uh, five years, I did two and a half hours to work two and a half hours back. And that drove me crazy. Um, the 235 miles a day was when we were living up in Poughkeepsie, and that was uh, from uh, 93 to, I don't remember. Now we moved. Okay, it really wasn't that long. It really wasn't that long. It was just about five years between all of that stuff. Uh, when I wasn't working, 235 miles a day, I was driving two and a half hours each way, so it was five hours a day in commuting. Five hours a day in commuting is, is a killer, amen. So, uh, But, you know, I had to have my standards, and I had to get up and get out the door, and, and uh, that's the thing that governed my life. So the way that we dress, the way that we act, the activities which we are involved in, our personal code of Christian ethics, which ultimately controls our behavior. Amen. Standards by, are where we live out our inner convictions that we have developed from Bible principles. Amen. So let's talk about aspects of holiness standards. Let's see. We got time. Yeah, we got a couple of minutes. We can go till ten o'clock. Amen. Um, Let's see, page number five. The word standard is defined as a simple test for determining the authenticity of something intangible. Holiness standards are therefore not principles, uh, the principal part of holiness, but they are an external sign that an authentic work of salvation has taken place. 
Many years ago, there was a widespread fire in Baltimore when the firemen from New York came to help with their equipment. They were of little use. The hoses would not fit the hydrants in Baltimore. So they drove these fire trucks all the way down to Baltimore, found out they couldn't hook their fire trucks up to the fire hydrants, and then they had a standardization of fire hydrants. Okay? There are three kinds of standards for living. Holiness standards that God expects every mature Christian to adhere to. Bible standards. These are principles that are explicitly commanded in the word of God. They demand immediate obedience upon salvation. And these principles are non-negotiable for Christians. Now, I will say that holiness is also a learning experience. Okay? And you don't get in trouble with God until you resist the moving of the Holy Ghost. You got to understand that. When we're talking about holiness and righteousness and change of life and so on and so forth, um, there are people that just don't get it. And God gives them space. But there are people that get it and they refuse the Spirit of God. That's a different story. They'll get in trouble with God. Now, how long does it take them to get in trouble with God? I don't know. I'm not God. See, God, revert, God reserves that choice for himself. And we get that from Noah in the ark. God preached judgment. Judgment came. Who got to shut the door on the ark? God. That wasn't Noah's job. So my job is not to shut the door on people. You know, as a pastor now, if I have somebody that's causing trouble in the church, then I might have to send them on their way, do something else somewhere else. But as far as shutting salva door of salvation, maybe they'll go somewhere else and be saved. I don't know. I can't, I can't shut that door. I can only take care of the house of God that, that I'm in charge of. Okay. Okay, so church standards. These are life principles that are established by spiritual leadership to deal with practical applications of spiritual principles in modern situations. We use what we call, for example, the choir standard or platform standard. And we have that. We ask the people not to wear jewelry, no makeup, no nail polish, colored nail polish, uh, modestly dressed for both men and women. Uh, no jewelry. We ask those things. Those are, those are church standards. And really, those are the standards that we need to live by, not just practice them in church. Personal standards. These are life principles that are prompted by the Holy Ghost in an individual life due to unique backgrounds of each believer. These will never contradict those standards established by the pastor that God has given. Personal convictions are above and beyond what the church already teaches. There are many levels of maturity in God's family, just like the natural family, but each member is valuable to God in their present stage. Each, and this is one thing you've got to understand about the church. You have so many different people and people in different stages of their experience with God. If you push somebody in, that is in a, in a more of a beginning stage, and you're in more of an advanced stage, if you push people, then you can cause them to be lost because they will get bitter and angry at you. So you have to do your best to be loving and you have to do your best to, be, to guide people. Now, how long do you give people space? Again, that's up to the Lord. That's, that's not up to me. Okay, let's look at Romans 15, 1 through 2. Brother Micah. If our faith is strong, we should be patient with the Lord's followers whose faith is weak. We should try to please them instead of ourselves. We should think of their good and try to help them. Okay, look at the next one, Matthew 18 and 6. Jesus said, it will be terrible for people who cause even one of my little followers to sin, those people will be better off thrown into the deepest part of the ocean with a heavy stone tied around their necks. All right. So the more mature I become in my lifestyle of holiness, the more God can use me. Amen. 
Uh, let's look at first, second Timothy two, nineteen through twenty one. But God's truth standards truth stands firm like a foundation stone with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and those who claim they belong to the Lord must turn away from all wickedness. Some utensils are made of gold and silver, and some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions, and the cheap ones are for everyday use. If you keep yourself pure, you will be a utensil God can use for his purpose. Your life will be clean and you will be ready for the master to use you for every good work. Okay, think about Joseph in Genesis chapter 50. Joseph's motivation not to sin, he said it was against God to fool around with Potiphar's wife. And he had a dream to protect. Now, submission to spiritual guidance is an important part of my growth in holiness. Um, let's look at these next two scriptures, Brother Mike. Warn that some matters are not a lack of revelation, but a lack of submission to God. You must intentionally and actively educate your conscience. No, oh, I had that in red. That's not scripture. Yeah, I think but, so. Oops. Titus yep. 1 and 15. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls, and they know they are accountable to God. Give them reason to this, do this joyfully and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. Notice it doesn't say not their benefit. It says your benefit. In the Spanish church, I talk, taught on Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 3 through, or 17 through 31, 3 through 17. I've made you a watchman of the house of Israel. Give them Hear the words at my mouth and give them warning from me. So that's what the pastor is supposed to do, be a watchman for the house of the Lord. And if we refuse to follow the word of God, it's not going, the blood will be off of my hands. It will be on your hands. Uh, but it says, give them reason to do this joyfully and not with sorrow. Talking about the leadership that certainly would not be for your benefit. So I hope that this has helped you a little bit with our, with our understanding of holiness. Um, let's sing a song. Let's worship a little bit, and we'll be dismissed and go home. Amen. And this is different tonight for those that are watching online, but um, I usually don't sit down, but I was feeling a little woozy tonight. Amen. Let's all stand. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness. Is what, what I need. Holiness, holiness is what, what you want from me. Take my heart. Oh, and Lord Jesus, God, we pray that you touch our minds and our spirits Take tonight, God. Mind. But bless your name, Lord. And ask that you'd help us, transform God. Transform our minds, God. Transform us and change our hearts, God. In Jesus' name. Conform it to, to yours, to yours, oh Lord.
Transform it and take my will. Conform it to yours, to yours, to yours oh, oh Lord. Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your touch tonight, God. To we yours, praise you, Lord. We yours, pray that you'd help us, God, help oh us to grow in you, help Lord. us to walk with you, God, and we'll make and sure and glorify yours. you and magnify you, Lord. Amen. Amen. And everybody say in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you for being in the house of the Lord tonight.